Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Corvus Corax. Say never more, said Shadow. Fuck you, said the Raven. When you're on your own, behind enemy lines, no artillery, no air strikes, no hope of any vac, you don't fight dirty. You do things that make dirty look good. You cannot see the future with tears in your eyes. How much more perfect a monster could I have been had the shadows loved me as much as they loved Korax. Not to be confused with the awesome neo-medieval band of the same name. Corvus Korax, Akka the Deliverer, the Raven Lord, Chooser of the Slain, the Liberator, the Lord of Shadows, Edgar Allan Primarch, heavy metal anti-social sanguineous and space goth brave star, is the Primarch of the Raven Guard. Korax was big on fast assaults, and screamo music, it's a surprise his chapter motto isn't brand new lyrics, and is notorious both for being the head of one of the hardest hit legions during the Horus Heresy and for the steps Korax took to try to help the Imperium, as well as the self-imposed exile he put himself to in an attempt to atone for what he had caused. While TG often jokes that he's emo, he's also a complete badass, like a lot of the Primarchs, and unlike this fucker actually got shit done. He got a suit of power armor named after him, unlike others who could have. He also had some kind of psychic invisibility. He was reportedly able to walk among people and pass completely unnoticed, maybe like Big E himself when doing his Odin thing? Comma it doesn't work on machines or any other kind of mechanical device due it not being actual invisibility. From how it sounds, it appears that Korax erased himself from people's minds. So Korax himself is still fully visible in reality, explaining why machines can still see him, but he's manipulating other people's minds to erase his presence from their perception, in the same way how ECM is able to fool radars by masking a plane's radar signature. However, he hid this ability even from his own legion, being quite aware about the Imperium's attitude towards Sickers. He shares his name with that of a common raven, also known as the Northern Raven, a large, all-black passerine bird noted for being among the most intelligent avians, if not the singularly most so. He loves Black Sabbath, as all should. Follow the Primarch's example. The Liberator. Like all the Primarchs, Korax was scattered by chaos to prevent the Umbra from destroying their plans. Korax wound up on Lycalius, a dry, dusty moon with no atmosphere, orbiting the planet Kyver. At this time the planet was a technologically advanced forge world, providing Kyver's gigantic manufactorums with minerals extracted from Lycalius by slave labor. The slaves of Lycalius were mostly regular people, inhabitants of the moon, as well as criminals political opponents of the wealthy aristocracy on Kyiva, and Kyavaran workers who had done crimes such as failing to meet quotas or taking one too many bathroom breaks. In essence, Lycalius was an unlimited source of free, exploitable manpower, which they kept in line with hired guns and openly executing anyone who tried to escape. When the people of Lycalius found Korax as an infant, they were mystified. No one could identify where he had come from and yet all could tell there was something unearthly, and extremely important, about the child. They named him Korax, the Deliverer, in their language, and in spite of the risks and drain on resources, they took him in and kept him safe from their masters. Believing that Korax was their salvation from the Kyavaran's tyranny, they began training him in the various skills he would need both as a leader and as a warrior, urban warfare, close combat, and demolitions work as well as political and philosophical training and analysis. Ultimately Korax's abnormally fast maturation, being a Primarch and all, comforted the slaves and united them in believing that Korax was the savior they had waited for. Finally the day came when Korax was old enough to assume leadership and fulfill his destiny. He began his task by quietly organizing the workers into fight teams, promoting the best, smartest, and strongest to squad leaders. He began using the mine's fabrication tech to create weaponry, and then hid stockpiles of equipment in strategic positions throughout the mines. Korax took full advantage of the environment the Kyavarans had set up, doing a bang-up impression of anonymous and staging strikes, sit-ins, 
and riots in strategic spots, knowing that the Kyavrans would deal with them harshly and feed the flames. Finally things reached their breaking point and Korax's forces launched their attack, taking key positions. With a combination of sabotage, strategic demolitions, and access to manufactured stolen weaponry, Korax's forces killed the occupation force to the man in the moon of Lycalius declared its independence. When Carver's rulers struck back with their armed forces, Korax was ready for them, having seized the equipment of the defense forces Carver had left behind, and used the fabrication equipment to make demolitions grade ordnance for the battles to come. At every battle, the Kyavarans found battle-hardened warriors who were exceedingly skilled in urban and hit-and-run warfare, guerrillas that constantly ambushed and outmaneuvered their heavily armed and armored forces, whittling down their ranks. With Carver's forces already demoralized and destabilized, Korax pulled a MacGyver-esque feat of ledger domain and sent a set of nuclear mining charges along the gravity tethers used for moving supplies and ore shipments to Kyavar, blowing the Kyavaran manufactorums to hell and guaranteeing that the Kyavarans couldn't produce a thing. The tech guilds who ran Kyavar plunged into civil war, and with this, the conflicts for control of Lycalius was won. In celebration, they renamed the Moon Deliverance. That very day, the Emperor arrived, apparently pleased with what Korax had accomplished, and after the two spent a day and a half together, he appointed Korax head of the newly formed Raven Guard. Nothing is written regarding what Korax and the Emperor discussed that day except for Korax's sole condition of acceptance, that the Emperor help restore peace on Kyiva. The Emperor agreed and the Adeptus Mechanicus took control of Kyiva, rebuilding it and turning it into a glorious shard of the Imperium. Deliverance, meanwhile, was reinforced, and the citadel that had once housed the guards the Kyavarans had deployed to maintain order was now, ironically, the headquarters of the Legion, dubbed the Revenge Spire. In contrast, many Primarchs preferred to leave their home planets as feral or death worlds. Some of the older rebels were left to help govern their planet. However, like many of his brothers Corvus allowed the younger ones to become a start, and they became the template for the revamped more idealistic Raven Guard. They formed the core of the Legion's more Dathan elite. It should be noted that Corvus Corax was one of the few Primarchs who grew up with a maternal figure, well, several. Comma with the other being Robo Gulleton. Other than a few older women who took in part as Corax's mommies, there was also Nasturi Afrenia, who was for all intents and purposes, Corax's only Chan. Granted, Korax's fast maturation meant that he looked around the same age as Nasturi when he saved her by ripping an abusive guard's head off and shitting down his neck. The fact of that matter is, 200 years on in the Great Crusade, Nasturi, who by now is a shipmaster of a battle barge, is the only person who can talk down to him. With that many Araris, it could be a reason why Korax remains one of the few stable and level-headed, albeit super melancholic. Primarchs when Horus got his heresy on and one of the few genuinely empathetic ones who have been taught by his moms and his older sister that sometimes, it is okay for a boy to cry. Great Crusade. Little is spoken, sensing a pattern here. Comma of Korax's role in the Great Crusade, though his contributions were many. A firm proponent of mobile strikes, tactical planning, and careful sabotage. The Raven Guard excelled at lightning fast strikes and covert operations, but several of the Primarchs were not quite so sold on it. Rogel Dawn disliked the combat style of the Raven Guard, though the two purportedly respected one another. Korax would have likely gotten along swimmingly with Alpharius and Conrad Kurz, due to similar tactical doctrines, but the three Primarchs would be deployed to opposite sides of the Imperium during the Great Crusade, and would never really manage to hook up. Then again, it's implied pretty strongly that Corvus always hated what Kurz stood for, no matter how similar their tactics, and shticks and weird sickness and overall personas, were. Actually maybe it's not that hard to see why the emo bird hated the Gothage Lord. Comma we don't know of any collabs with the Alpha Legion, but really, we wouldn't, would we? One wonders what Corvus and Alpharius would have done if their positions were switched. While Kurz distances himself from his kind of similar brother by being a total psychopath, Alpharius does more so by virtue of being much more mysterious and much emotionally present or relatable. 
Comoros of Massacre, it is shown that both the Raven Guard and Night Lords worked together during the Pharaonatus extermination. But judging from Corvus's disdain for Conrad, it did not end well. One person who Korax flat out didn't get along with was Horus, with him being one of the few Primarchs who didn't get along swimmingly with the Golden Boy. What wasn't pessimism or jealousy, maybe it was foresight, and vice versa. Comma the pair never saw eye to eye, with Korax being too humanitarian for Horus tastes and Horus being too much of a cockmongler for Korax's liking. The two also disliked one another's tactical choices, and on at least one occasion, the two nearly came to blows after Horus ordered Corvus Legion into a frontal assault on a heavily defended fortress. A little strange, given that the Iron Warriors and Space Wolves were present and much better suited to these tactics, but it basically boiled down to Horus being a prick. The pre-Corvus Legion served under Horus, and rolled more like the Night Lords than the emo ninjas we know and love today. Corvus who saw some uncomfortable parallels with the slavers of his home world, promptly set about changing this, which undoubtedly pissed off Horus. Big Brother decided to flex his war master muscles, and when Corvus proposed a sensible alternative per Chirabo called him a big pussy. The result was a pile of dead ravens, millions of civilian corpses, who hadn't rebelled willingly, but were under the control of alien parasites, and Lemon Russ of all people breaking up a fight between Corvus and Percherabo. It's suspected that Percherabo played a major role in giving the Ravens the job of trialing the Mark VI Beaky armor, believing it to be inferior. Being the bigger man, Korak said fuck this and left Horus command, hooking up with some kindred spirits in the form of Ferris Manus and Vulcan. The three hit it off pretty well and found their forces worked really, really well together. They then went and continued the Great Crusade without having to deal with Horus acting like a shit. The one upside from the Gate 42 debacle was that the Terran Marines and the Legion had been largely wiped out in the assault, taking the Warrior Lodges with them. The survivors became a Black Shield force known as Ashen Claws, after being sent off on their own towards the Ghoul Stars. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. The Horus Heresy. When the Horus Heresy occurred, the Raven Guard, Iron Hands, and Salamanders were all on the front lines on Istvan V. Each faction was well suited to lead the vanguard of the attack, but they would wind up getting trapped and pinned down in the worst part of the fighting, when four more legions turned traitor and joined Horus Rebellion. The three legions already in the thick of it wound up in a bitter fight which cost them many men, as well as the Iron Hands Primarch, Ferris Manus. During the battle Korax engaged Lorga in personal combat after shredding the Galvor back, giving his sons a chance to run for the hills. Kind of like the huntsman scene in an ultra gritty reboot of Bambi. Corvus easily overwhelmed Lorga, demanding answers to why he betrayed them. Lorga tried to tell Korax of the truth he had discovered, but Korax's responses amounted to heresy is bad and you should feel bad, and he said it with lightning claws. Korax was just about to behead Lorga when Conrad Kurz intervened. At this point, Korax's resolve broke, for he looked into the eyes of the Night Haunter and finally knew fear, not the fear of death, but fear that but for chance he could have turned into something as twisted as Kurz, particularly when you think of the repressive origins of his legion. Retreating. Korax's forces, primarily designed for quick insertion and cover tops duty and not sticking around in a meat grinder suffered the heaviest casualties, and though they fought desperately alongside the salamanders and iron hands, killing countless traitor marines in turn, the loyalists were still slaughtered wholesale, forcing all three legions to withdraw, and leaving them largely unable to stop Horus advance. Korax realized how dire the situation was and returned to Terra to give the Emperor his report. His warnings to Cernal Jossen were not listened to and now it was too late. 
Far too late for now, anyway. The Imperium was collapsing, with the Loyalists outnumbered and Gilliman chasing Alpharius halfway across the galaxy and or building his own empire. The Emperor needed warriors, and Deliverance had none to spare. Searching for a solution, Korax, knowing his sons lacked the manpower and expertise to be of much use in the coming Siege of Terror, and seeking absolution for running from Kurs and Lorga, beseeched the Emperor, who was already spending all his time and most of his psychic strength on the Golden Throne to prevent a warp gate from opening at the bottom of the Imperial Palace, to spend Korax and his legion in a suicide or glory plan, to send the Raven Guard out to disrupt traitor supply lines, buying Rogaldorn time to fortify Terra and the Emperor time to regain control of the webway. Agreeing that the Raven Guard should continue their lightning strike and cover tops tactics, but unwilling to send one of his last loyal legions to almost certain death, the Emperor decided to give Korax a dangerous, but potentially game-changing, gift, access to the Emperor's memories on the creation of the Primox, and the location of the original complex where they were made, including the knowledge of how to use the long dormant equipment there. Using the ancient books of research notes the Emperor had left behind when making the first batches of space marines and the original genetic sample that the genomes of all Primarchs were derived from, Korax began essentially cloning marines at an alarming rate. He did not heed the book's warnings however, feeling that the urgency of his mission was of more import. After a fair amount of fuck-ups, a solution was found and Korax had discovered a way to make stronger, faster, and more quickly maturing. Physically, a starts out of toddlers. There were those that opposed this amongst the Legion, stating that if it were right to give a 5 year old that much power and produce them that quickly, then the Emperor would have done so, but Korax maintained that they were in dire straits, which called for an exception. Then the Alpha Legion laid the fuck down on that entire plan, and corrupted the gene seed that the entire project was and ever would be using. While the earlier products were basically functional, if not exactly well adjusted, space marines, the final batch were a horrible mess of mutants. Korax made the best of a bad situation, assembling a raptor contingent out of all surviving marines, giving arms to whomever could use them and improvised, custom armor to the most heavily mutated, and sending them off to attack the traitor's vulnerable rear supply lines. It worked out remarkably well, all of the raptors possessed enhanced senses and reflexes, which may have led to the camouflage and marksmanship obsession of modern raptors, allowing them to sneak around and fight even better than other members of the Legion, and the rough mutants among them were thought of as unlucky battle brothers, equal in all respects to the smooth, non-disfigured marines, rather than monsters to be shunned. Ironically, when they encountered a small space wolf for sent to watch Korax, and, it is heavily implied, to try and kill him if he turned traitor, those who suffered from the curse of the wolf and turned out to be far less tolerant of such overt mutation. Unfortunately, it turned out that in the long run this gene seed corruption led to a slow degradation of consciousness and eventually total, bestial madness. In it Italy prepared to die alongside the space wolves at Yarant, after being unnerved at seeing one of his strongest brothers cast so low. Later whilst fighting back to back with Bjorn, decided it was a pretty stupid decision to let two Primarchs and their legions perish, and ordered a retreat similar to what happened on Ister. Post-heresy. After the Horus heresy, Gilliman came back and had a sudden surprising outbreak of common sense. This is a source of hot debate. Many view this decision as the highest degree of fucked demanding that the legion subdivide so that no one person could ever hold the kind of power that led to Horus but fucking the entire Imperium. Korax hesitantly agreed, and split his forces, but he remained racked with guilt, he could not forget what he had done to help save the Imperium, and was left with a horrid choice of what to do about the shambling abominations still kept in the holding cells of the Raven Spa. Eventually, he came to the conclusion that, as he was responsible for their creation, he is the one who now must grant them the Emperor's mercy, by his own hand, and executed the devolved mutants one by one. He then locked himself in Revenge Spire, and for nearly a year, did not come out, having spent most of that time in Lamentation and the rest playing Dwarf Fortress. When he did emerge, Korax left Deliverance and made a beeline for the Isle of Terror, heading there to settle the score. Quoth the Korax, Nevermore. It is believed that like Lemon Russ, 
Lion Elginson, and Vulcan. Korax will return in the final apocalyptic battle versus Chaos, when the Emperor returns, and that then, and only then, will he have the absolution he sought. TG often jokes that on that same day, Indrik Borowale will talk normally. But after all those time in Eye of Terror he might as well have became Demon Pre. Historator 109, 163, 233, 200 decommissioned by Inquisitorial Decree. And as it turns out, that's mostly what happened. After some time in the eye, Korax gained a fuckload of new abilities by listening to Painted Black by the Rolling Stones set on repeat, like the ability to tashapa shift into a flock of red-eyed ravens with beaks so sharp they punch through ceramide like paper, turning into what looks like a living pool of darkness that can move through cracks and soil, while retaining strength enough to lift marines up into the air before folding them into pretzels, turning into a meteor and gaining the ability to manipulate shadows like the Umbra. He could also turn himself back into his normal self, with the exceptions being his jump pack was now replaced with metallic raven wings, making him the metal version of Sanguinius, and with his strength, speed, and durability all cranked up to 11. Note that despite his new form and powers, Korax is not a demon. He is not affected by wards that affect demons in any way and when Lorga sees him he says he does not see a demon, even though he ends up being so strong that he can take on Lorga, who is a demon prince, in a one on one fight and come out on top, presumably because Lorga never read that taking the demon prince upgrade doesn't always work out for you. Lorga's sons pull him out of the fight, by unloading everything they had into Korax, which gives him some light bruises on his face and a black eye when it becomes clear he is not going to win. While Lorga considered his own change into a demon Primarch to be an ascension, Korax considered his new Shapa shifting state to reflect their soul's true origin as warp forge weapons. He's also become extremely brutal, torturing and mutilating Chaos Marines as he attempts to hunt down his fallen brothers, especially Lorga. Ironically, his fear of ending up like Conrad Kurz has come to pass albeit with his vengeance aimed at the traitor legions, and loyalty to the emperor intact. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.